Hey everyone, today we are looking into Georgina Cavendish, the daughter of a leading English noble who married into the most prominent magnate families in Britain in 1774, becoming Duchess of Devonshire. She would go on to become a powerful figure in British politics, but her personal life was blighted by gambling addiction, heavy drinking and extramarital affairs. This is her story. The woman who became famous throughout England as the Duchess of Devonshire was born on the 7th of June 1757 as Georgina Spencer at Wimbledon in Surrey. She was the eldest daughter of John Spencer, later First Earl Spencer. John was the leading member of the Spencer aristocratic family, which traced its lineage in England back to at least the 15th century, and her mother was Margaret Georgina Spencer, ne points. The Spencers were a prominent noble family in mid 18th century England. It was a time when aristocrats such as the Spencers lived an itinerant lifestyle, often spending time at court in London before retiring to their country estates in the off season. This was no different for the Spencer family, and Georgina travelled widely along with her two surviving younger siblings, George and Harriet. During her youth, the Spencers also entertained many prominent literary and political figures in their home at St James's in London. As a consequence, Georgina began to develop a charming manner and sophistication in terms of her learning and ability to interact with England's high society. This was the Hanoverian or Georgian period in English history, one in which strict rules of decorum and behaviour prevailed at the courts of Europe. Individuals who could master the rules of court society flourished, and Georgina excelled in this regard. It was in the summer of 1772, when Georgina was nearing her 15th birthday, that she first met William Cavendish, while vacationing with her family at the town of Spa in the south of the Dutch Republic. Cavendish was nine years her senior, and since 1764 had been the fifth Duke of Devonshire. Georgina evidently made an impression on Cavendish, and a match was soon being encouraged by her parents, though they would not marry just yet, as Georgina's mother insisted that her daughter was too young to take on the duties of a duchess in 1772. Yet, they were eventually wed on the 7th of June 1774 at Wimbledon. The union of the Cavendish family with the Spencers was celebrated throughout England, given the political and social prominence of both lineages, but it was soon running into trouble. The Duke was a quiet individual, not given to outward shows of emotion, and this clashed considerably with Georgina, a highly extroverted young woman who had little interest in settling into a retiring life as a country noble's wife. This clash of personalities was compounded by Georgina's natal problems, and she suffered several miscarriages in the 1770s and early 1780s. Owing to their unhappiness in wedlock, both sought distractions from their marriage. The Duke used the vast riches of the Cavendish family to begin developing the town of Buxton in Derbyshire in the Peak District as a spa town, modelled on the famous town of Bath in the south of England. Meanwhile, Georgina developed a keen interest in Georgian fashion and was soon being imitated in her dress sense and mannerisms by English high society. For instance, it was Georgina who popularised the late 18th century trend to wear one's hair in a large tower. But there was a darker side to the marital woes. Increasingly, as the years passed, Georgina drank heavily and gambled enormous sums of money. These were hardly unusual pastimes for the English nobility, at a time when Britain's empire was expanding and vast riches were pouring into the country from the colonies in North America and India, but Georgina took such vices to an extreme. Thus, 
while the circle of figures she gathered around at her Devonshire house in Mayfair in London included some notable literary figures, it also became a bastion of drunks, libertines and profligate gamblers from amongst the Georgian nobility and gentry. It should be stated that Georgina wasn't happy with this lifestyle. Letters of hers to close friends in the late 1770s and early 1780s express sentiments which we would now recognise as symptoms of depression. To make matters worse, she watched her younger sister begin to develop these same vices as a result of her time spent at Devonshire House. Yet, there was a strange contradiction in all of this. The English press lionised and celebrated her at the same time, for her fashion sense and the friends she kept. Georgina's life began to change course, however, from the late 1770s. In 1775, after years of political conflict, the British colonies in North America had initiated a war of independence to free themselves from British rule. Now, in 1778, Georgina was approached by the prominent Whig politician in England, Charles James Fox, who believed that Georgina could use her popularity to build up support for the war in America at home in England. The Duchess was convinced, and in the months that followed, she was responsible for promoting the effort to bring the colonies back under crown control by dressing in semi-military garb and encouraging the other women of London high society to do the same. It was the beginning of a sustained period of involvement in the Whig party, the forerunner of the modern liberals. She also seems to have begun an affair with Fox, which was carried on intermittently between 1780 and 1784, though the details of it are rather shadowy. Though women did not sit for Parliament at the time, Georgina became a significant political figure in her own right when Fox led the Whig party into government in the early 1780s, and she acted as a go-between for him with the Prince of Wales, the future King George IV, who was an increasingly significant figure in England owing to his father, King George III's periodic bouts of psychological instability and mental illness. Yet, Georgina's first foray into political life came to an end in 1784, following an election which was held that year in the House of Commons. King George III, having entered a more lucid period of his reign, had joined with the leader of the Conservative Tory party, William Pitt, to try and oust Fox from power, and if possible, that he would lose his own seat at Westminster. Given her alliance with Fox in the previous years, Georgina became a target during the election campaign. Several newspapers began attacking her character, focusing on charges of sexual promiscuity. Georgina attempted to act as though the accusations did not faze her, but in reality, she was stung by these attacks by a society which had previously praised her. This was compounded when Fox and the Whigs were soundly defeated by Pitt's Tories in the election. Having retreated from political life, Georgina now became further embroiled in a menage a trois which would shape her life for years to come. Already in 1782, a friend of hers, Lady Elizabeth Foster, better known as Bess, a daughter of the 4th Earl of Bristol, had insinuated herself into the Devonshire household, having become destitute. There, she was soon involved in a relationship with the Duke, Georgina's husband, while her relationship with the Duchess seems to have also developed a sexual dimension to it. Jealousies developed, compounded by the fact that Georgina brought two children to terms successfully in the mid-1780s. Two daughters, Georgina and Harriet, were born in 1783 and 1785 respectively. Yet, at the very same time, Bess also bore two of the Duke's children, named Caroline and Augustus, children which were raised by the Cavendishes as members of the family. This hopelessly complex situation continued into the second half of the 1780s, made worse by Georgina's enormous gambling debts 
and Bess's efforts to try and have the Duke look for a divorce from his wife. Now, rumours began to abound throughout England that the Duchess was being blackmailed by various individuals as a result of owing money all over the country, while politically, her links to the Whigs were compromised by her associations with the Prince of Wales, whom Georgina borrowed extensive amounts of money from in the 1780s. This was the environment in which a new political crisis emerged in 1788, George III having slipped into another bout of borderline madness. The Duchess yet again threw her weight behind supporting Fox and the Whigs, but in the ensuing tussle, things did not work out as planned, partly because the King recovered his senses in the course of the campaign and was able to provide a boost for the Tories. Thus, the Whigs and Fox failed to gain control of the government during the crisis, and as had happened in 1784, the press was scathing in its attacks on Georgina. No sooner had the crisis settled down than Georgina, her husband, and Bess Foster left England for France, but it was a case of out of the frying pan and into the fire. The Cavendish family arrived into a country which was on the brink of revolution, and which would overthrow the monarchy and aristocracy of France in one of the defining moments in modern European history. The French Revolution erupted in the summer of 1789, but Georgina and her husband nevertheless remained in France for some time. While she was there, she finally gave birth to a male heir. William George Cavendish was born in June 1790. Shortly thereafter, as the revolution became more radical in France, the family returned to England. When back in England, she entered into another full-blown affair with a young Whig politician by the name of Charles Grey, and in 1792, she bore him a child, Eliza. The Duke, who was no stranger to producing illegitimate children himself, was enraged when he learned of this, and told Georgina that she could either leave England again, or he would press for a divorce. She chose exile, and spent much of the 1790s travelling through Europe with her sister Harriet and her children, though Eliza was raised by the Greys, and Georgina would go on to feel an enormous guilt about not being involved in her life. Eventually, having travelled through France, Switzerland and Italy, the group settled in Naples. This, though, would also prove to be a temporary exile. In 1793, she returned to England after her husband's initial anger had dissipated, but the subsequent period brought further adversity as she developed an infection in her eyes, which left her three quarters blind. There was one final act, one which displayed her strength of character. Having suffered greatly, for more years than was plausible for anyone to, Georgina began to rebuild her life towards the end of the 1790s. She quit gambling and learned to live with her partial blindness. Then, in 1801, a fresh period of political activity occurred as a result of William Pitt's resignation as Prime Minister. In the months that followed, the Duchess resumed the position she had held so effectively 20 years earlier as an intermediary between Charles James Fox and the Prince of Wales. As a result, she was instrumental in the creation of a broad political coalition in England, just as the country was becoming embroiled in a fresh war with France under Napoleon Bonaparte. Subsequently, she was instrumental in building a government in the mid-1800s which effectively united the Whigs and the Tories as war with France was entering a critical stage. Napoleon, having effectively conquered most of Europe, Britain and Russia being the only major exceptions. It was a fitting success at the end of her troubled life. On the 30th of March 1806, she died at Devonshire House in London. She was just 48 years of age and had succumbed to what is believed to be an abscess on her liver, a probable result of many years of excessive alcohol consumption. Hers was a strange life. She was a troubled individual with many personal flaws, 
but she was a paradoxically strong character who overcame significant adversity and carved out a significant position for herself in late Hanoverian England, at a time when women could still not vote, let alone occupy political office. As a result of this admixture of personal tragedy and a robust strong character, the Duchess has understandably been compared with Diana, Princess of Wales in modern times. It is a fitting comparison. The Duchess was the princess's great-great-great-great-aunt. Her life has been memorialised in a variety of different ways, including many books and films, notably the 2008 film The Duchess, directed by Saul Dibb and starring Kieran Knightley. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Georgina Cavendish, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave me a like and a comment down below, and if you're new, why not subscribe? Make sure to have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as they're uploaded. And if you have any suggestions, be sure to leave them in the comments or there are links to my Instagram and to my email in the description where you can also send any suggestions or recommendations. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.